this evening. I, uh, this meeting will be recorded and uh, just to let, give you a heads up, it will be recorded and available on our project webpage in the next seven days. And with that, I'll pass it over to Jack. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jack Cardis, and I'm uh, an associate with Pros Consulting, and I'd like to welcome you all tonight to the uh, Waterfront Access Plan uh, uh, workshop. Um, before we start, um, as uh, Stephanie said, we will be recording it. So Austin, you have, I'm sure, hit the record button by now. Um, we have a lot of people here in the room today. We had well over 100 people register for this uh, event. So what we're going to do is to be considerate of everybody's time and those that have budgeted their time for the one hour. We will be going through the presentation and we'll wrap it in an hour, but we will stay online and open for further conversation and discussion for as long as it takes after that. Um, so uh, I'd like to introduce a couple of people before we get started, and that's uh, Stephanie. Stephanie Cornejo is a park planner for the Miami-Dade Park Recreation Open Spaces Department, and she is overseeing the waterfront uh, planning project. She'll also be hosting the chat room and questions and answers section today. And Austin Hochstetler, who is an associate of mine with Pros Consulting, uh, and he is uh, facilitating the Zoom and the polling tonight as well. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to have a quick little agenda here that shows what uh, we'll, we'll be doing a little introduction. Uh, we'll take you through the waterfront planning process. We'll do a little polling and workshop session, followed by some Q&A and then some next steps. And then we'll do a little workshop survey at the end. Um, you know, as part of our housekeeping, uh, you know, we're in a digital format, everyone from the COVID-19 virus. So we'd like to facilitate a, a comfortable digital meeting and ensure that everyone understands just how we will use the Zoom for our public workshop this evening. So if you move your cursor or your mouse around over the bottom or it could be the top of your screen, um, you will see a, a set of icons there. Um, the first one is the chat icon. We will be taking a few polls throughout the day uh, through this. Um, and so, you know, I want to make sure that you are aware of that use. This feature will only be available during the polls um, and we'll use it to track input from you during the workshop. The other feature is the raise your hand feature. Um, please use this feature only during the workshop session portion of our agenda today if you'd like to share your input verbally. Um, the other one is the Q&A, and this Q&A function is where most people uh, choose to go. Uh, we will be monitoring questions and comments from you throughout the workshop, um, so uh, please type those in and uh, we will get to them. And it's really good because we will always have a record, a written record of your contributions. So as a friendly reminder, if you have connectivity issues, don't worry, just log back into the session. You may need to leave the session for any reason. You can uh, should be sure to type in your questions and comments in that Q&A function. Um, and please remember, go to the miamidade.gov site and uh, click on to the Parks Department and take the waterfront survey. We'll remind you of that again before you leave. So today what we'd like to do is start with just a little discussion about your park system. Miami-Dade County Parks Recreation Open Spaces Department is the third largest park system in the country. Um, it serves 2.7 million residents through its regional park system, and at the local level, it serves 1.4 million residents that reside in the unincorporated Miami-Dade County. On your screen, you can see all of the things that we do. There are 270 parks countywide, um, and including six marinas and boat ramps, which is what we're here tonight to talk about. And for those of you who don't uh, know it, we do have a uh, master plan. Miami-Dade County went through a master planning process that extended between 2006 and 2009. Um, and it was uh, a, a plan that resulted in literally 100 or more meetings like we're doing tonight throughout the community. Um, and that plan uh, in itself is a plan that was unanimously adopted by the Board of County Commissioners. Um, and we have been building out that plan since 2004 use, or using 2004 bond monies. That plan is about a $3 billion cost to building it out in its totality. 
Um, but all of the items in that plan came from meetings just like these. This plan is a 50 year vision for a connected system of parks and public spaces. So it's not just about a single destination for a park. It's about public spaces and those natural and cultural areas and the greenways and the blueways and the complete streets that tie them all together. And one of the best features of the plan is that is its gestures towards great greenways and blueways or the waterway systems around the community. These are the ones that provide wildlife habitat, scenic vistas, recreation and transportation opportunities that serve to connect parks with each other and to the communities through open space corridors and waterways. And perhaps one of the best thing about the park system here, besides the 270 parks and the more than 300 municipal park, sorry, municipal parks and the more than uh, 34 municipalities we have around the community, um, is the fact that we are bookended by Everglades National Park and Biscayne National Park. And both of those, as you know, are uh, all about water and there are great connectors between the two of them. So we're very, very lucky to live in this park laden community that we're in. So the Florida Inland Navigation District has partnered with the Miami-Dade County Parks, Recreation and Open Spaces Department to begin work on the long awaited Waterfront Recreation Access Plan or RAP as we refer to it. The intent is to develop a strategic plan that will unify in a single document recommendations for improving public access to the county's waterways while protecting the marine environment and working waterfront businesses and providing for an increase in recreational and ecotourism opportunities, climate change adaptation and connectivity to the bay through our transportation, inland canal and lake systems. That's saying a lot there. That was a long sentence, but what you need to know is that the RAP is a transformational document that will inspire and guide our policymakers, public agencies and elected officials in making the best decisions for our waterways that will include the ideas that you generate today. So to that end, an interdisciplinary team of professional planners, environmental engineers, and economists led by the Miami-Dade Parks Department's Planning and Research Division is developing the RAP. Elements of the planning process include a comprehensive review of all available documents related to waterway management, protection, and governance, along with stakeholder interviews and interactive public engagement workshops like this one to understand exactly what our citizens need and want. And as a component of the county's park and open space master plan, the vision for the RAP is to provide improved public access to Biscayne Bay and the other waterways of Miami-Dade County in order to encourage residents and visitors to responsibly use, enjoy, and protect these unique natural resources. And to realize this vision, the RAP's shared values include public access for everyone and more types of users. So in other words, whether you own a power boat or a sailboat or you fish on a head boat or a fishing pier or from a bridge or you swim in the bay or one of the atoll pools or you simply walk along the shoreline, we will emphasize connections, the, your ability to get access to the waterway. And we will emphasize access for the economically disadvantaged and create opportunities for the disabled, increased opportunities for tourists, residents, and school-aged children. And that's for all types of use, whether you own a boat, a motorboat, a sailboat, whether you're in a kayak or a paddleboard, whether you use our boat ramps or our marina wet slips, um, we need more access. And I'm sure many of you will, will let us know just how uh, difficult it is sometimes to launch your vessels and to get access to our waterways. Another shared value, value is responsible use and greater access will promote environmental protection. We know that the users will demand policies that protect the resources. We also know environmental policies could be more efficient and effective and in, can encourage public participation as well. Another one of the values is that all our public access points will reflect natural beauty, native and, and sustainable landscaping and materials, low impact designs, so in other words, less concrete, more natural solutions. 
We, will also, we also know that uh, increased access will grow the economy and increase jobs. And water sports, retail and entertainment industries will grow. Boating industry will grow. It is a $12 billion annual economic in, impact that uh, the boating industry has in South Florida. So we know that uh, this will grow our economy. And finally, we want to encourage people to get involved and stay involved. This project is about citizen stewardship. People want to help and we educate the community as, the op as to the opportunities to volunteer and take responsibility for protecting and reinvigorating our marine environment. So striking the right balance, that's always the challenge. The balance of public access, environmental protection, economic sustainability, and climate resilience these are all together what the RAP will represent and how the RAP will have to create a balance between the various tensions that sometimes get created between those objectives. Currently, most activity is concentrated near the bay, and this has a profound impact on both the health of the bay and of the residents. You know, there's a common lament that we hear that residents live very near to one of the most beautiful water bodies in the world, but due to the traffic and various congestion and other obstacles, they're unable to enjoy the water as frequently as they would like. And to reduce the impact on natural resources, new opportunities for waterfront recreation will need to be dispersed throughout the community. As you can see on the map on your screen, these are where the permitted marina operations are within the community, more than 200 of them. And they're all along the East Coast. By opening up recreational opportunities and water bodies closer to where people live, we can relieve the pressure on environmentally sensitive lands, reduce our carbon footprint from all those folks that drive all the way from West Kendall all the way to Biscayne Bay to get to a water experience. And we can just increase opportunities for all the various demographics in our community, ultimately increasing community well-being. Just think of how many canals, lakes, and running east to west across our community and all the way out to the Everglades and what kind of recreation value those have. So the planning team is working from three overarching planning concepts. And the first of those is called the spectrum of recreation opportunities. It nearly 50% of water use in our community does not involve a power or a sailboat. In fact, it, it, most usage is kayaks, canoes, swimming, walking along a shoreline, or fishing from a pier or, or a bridge. Um, so the average person in our community has a different relationship to the water than the average boater. So we will be developing, as the screen, a diagram on your screen shows, a spectrum beginning with primitive sites with access but no amenities to limited sites that might include a restroom or a concession to those more network types of sites that are typically located along the intercoastal waterway. And finally, those full uh, amenity water experiences like Bayside Marina, where you have the uh, uh, dockage, parking, concessions, retail, entertainment, and special events. Um, in the wrap, um, there will be a connected plan for all of these different degrees of access and use. The second concept for planning is compatible and shared use. It's the key to all active waterfronts. Land is simply too expensive, so using it for a single purpose is not practical. So multiple experiences and benefits is critical to a successful uh, waterfront that we can afford. Combining public access points with purpose-specific access points requires careful planning, but has great efficiency. So think in terms of temporary after hours docking for residents or visitors at marina based businesses that are not open during the evening hours. Sort of like church parking, right? You know, when, when there's malls that are closed, but on Sunday a church needs larger parking areas, think that same way with water, with the waterfront and access to dockage along perhaps the Miami River. Similarly, all kayaks and paddle boards and canoe launch areas for neighborhood residents to access waterways without driving their car to existing uh, boat ramps by making street ends available for launching facilities or sharing access with independent commercial fishers for dining and cultural experiences 
are seasonal and special event specific loading and offloading for ferry boat and water taxi passengers. And the third concept we've all heard of is the connectivity. Fully connected and accessible public space can also give neighborhoods a unique identity and help create connections through place attachment. And this is strong emotional bonds people form with their surroundings. An equitable provision of local parks with park access, uh, with water access connected to greenways, public transportation, water taxis is one way to lessen the disparity between the wealthy and the lower income neighborhoods by enhancing neighborhood assets. So the RAP will provide direction for improving public access and creating an interconnected system of publicly accessible waterfront destinations that includes expanded water-based transportation, increasing and enhancing nature-based recreation and ecotourism opportunities, protecting our natural resources and incorporating climate change adaptation along our shorelines, promoting sustainable economics, and mapping the park and open space systems blue ways water trail system. So that's in essence what we're up going to do. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn this over to Austin and Austin is going to get you engaged with a quick polling exercise. Austin, it's all yours. Great. Thank you, Jack. And so we have about seven questions that we're going to ask you to um, help us out with. And so this is the first engagement opportunity for this meeting. And as uh, Jack discussed at the beginning, we'll have other questions to be uh, asked and answered. And we'll also have kind of a discussion period as part of this, uh, this session tonight. But we wanted to do something a little bit different. So on your screen, if you're on your computer, uh, you should have a box that just popped up in, in front of you somewhere. If you're on a tablet or if you're on your phone, I'm not exactly sure it will pop up uh, in the best way possible. But you, like I said, there's other opportunities to uh, provide input. So this first question is just a single choice uh, question. So it's in order for us to get a better understanding of infrastructure and operational needs and who's attending, you know, who's representing this meeting tonight, which of the following categories best describes your main waterfront recreation use type? It's essentially, are you more of a motorized boater? Or are you more of a non-motorized boater? Or are you um, a waterfront user, shoreline user? So not necessarily going into the water, but you know, bay walk use and pier shoreline fishing, or you know, not applicable, do you not use or access waterfront areas? So if you do have the option, uh, please go ahead and start filling out this, uh, this poll. And so I can see how many people we have in our, in our room with us tonight and how many people are, are attending. So we'll go about another five seconds. So go five, four, three, two, one. Thank you. So I'll end it. And then in real time, we'll go ahead and share the results. So the box should pop back up onto your screen. So tonight we have with us um, about half the room, uh, non-motorized boating, and then very close between waterfront users and uh, motorized boater, and then uh, somebody that uh, does not use or access the waterfront areas. Perfect. So this is how this flows. And so, like I said, there's seven of these questions. So we'll just pop open the next one here. And so this is, again is a single choice answer. And so this is what water body do you most frequently use when boating or visiting the shoreline or waterfront? Do you most go to the Atlantic Ocean, most go to the Bay, uh, canals and lakes or the intercoastal waterway slash Miami River? And we understand that in these polls, You'll, you'll see this, that we're limited to about 10 options. And so some of these are gonna say, well, where I go is not up here on the list. It, it probably isn't because we'll, we'll, we'll get that in other mechanisms throughout this meeting tonight. So just keep that with a, as you fill out this poll, keep that in mind, please. Perfect, we're almost up to the number that voted on the last one. So I have my benchmark. So we'll go about another five seconds, four, three, two, one, thank you. So we'll share. So you should see the answers on the screen now. So uh, majority the bay, but follow, followed closely by the Atlantic Ocean, and then goes to the Intracoastal Waterway or Miami River, and then canals and lakes. Perfect. All right, question number three. 
So in a typical month, uh, how frequently do you engage in water activities? So we understand the last six or seven months have been vastly different. So start thinking about if you can, maybe 2019 or, or you know, kind of more of a normal kind of activity frequency use year. So in a typical month, how frequently do you engage in water activities? Never, uh, occasionally, uh, once a month, maybe once a week, or, you know, oftentimes more than once a week. Perfect, almost to the number. We'll go five seconds. Four, three, two, one. Perfect, thank you. All right, so we have a lot of heavier users. So more than once a week, uh, then follow closely. Oh, it's tied between uh, once a month and once a week, and then uh, occasionally uh, following up there and forth. Perfect, thank you. All right, so this is gonna be one of those first questions that, I, um, that I'll mention, that we are limited to 10 options. And so you might not have the option that you go to most frequently up here on this list, but we will, we will extract that. So um, what public waterfront and or boat launch in Miami-Dade County do you visit most frequently? Is it Black Point, Coconut Grove, Coral Gables, uh, Deering Estate, uh, Downtown Bay Bayside, um, Hullover, uh, Homestead, Miami Riverwalk, uh, Rickenbacker Causeway, South Beach um, slash Ocean Drive. And then this is where I'll actually start um, activating the chat pod. So I'm going to put in a poll, poll, public, shoreline. So the chat pod should be actually enabled for you all now. So if there is something up here that pertains to this question that you go to that's not necessarily up on this list, feel free to type that into the chat pod now. You should be able to type that into the chat pod. Again, just pertaining to this question. We have other mechanisms that will capture other comments and input, but just at this question. We'll go about another uh, five seconds. Thank you, Brett. Uh, Canal C2, perfect. Thank you, Alan. Perfect. Perfect. And everything that's going to be typed in and stuff like this, this is going to be helpful because we're going to be capturing this. So we'll go about another couple seconds here on the uh, poll. Three, two, one. Thank you. And as I'm debriefing here and sharing the results, please continue to uh, type in the names of the, of the shorelines and the public waterfront you go to in the, in the chat pod. Please feel free. So we have uh, seven for Rickenbacker Causeway. Okay. And then Hallover. Good dis uh, distribution here of the sites. I think everything actually has at least one person um, voted on. Thank you. Perfect. All right, question number five. So this is a, uh, you can select one, two, or all three of these. So this is about crowding. So please indicate if you have experienced any of the following statements during your boating or waterfront experience in Miami-Dade County in the last year. Have you felt overcrowding during your water experience where you either put your boat in the water or where you access the waterfront if you're a shoreline user? Have you changed launch sites to another site or if you're a shoreline user relocated to a different waterfront in general as a direct result of overcrowding? And or have you changed plans entirely as a direct result of overcrowding? Just, you know, not going to a different shoreline. We're just, we're just changing plans and, and doing something different. So you can answer one, two, or three of these options. We'll go about another five seconds. Four, three, two, one. Perfect, thank you. Show results. So the majority have at least felt some sort of crowd overcrowding when, um, when you have accessed the waterfront, perfect. And then a lot have actually changed plans entirely as a result of that. So perfect, this is good information for us to know. Okay, almost there. So this is a, a willingness to travel question. So this is a single answer question. So how far would you travel to launch your boat or visit the shoreline or waterfront if your preferred ramp wasn't available or if your preferred shoreline or waterfront was uh, overcrowded? Would you be willing to travel less than 10 miles away? Maybe somewhere between 10 and 20 miles away? Greater than or equal to 20 miles away, or you know what, none. I would not travel to a different location. That's fine too. So again, this is kind of a this is a single answer question. Uh, 
Perfect. So we'll go another five seconds. Four, three, two, one. Thank you. All right. So actually split here between uh, basically 20 miles and less. So less than 10 miles away and then somewhere between 10 and 20 miles. Perfect. Thank you. And then the last question here. This is a question about safety. So thinking about the waterfront you, you use the most. So think a couple questions back when you thought about the waterfront or, or the access point that you, uh, that you use most often. How safe do you feel the surrounding waterway areas is or are? So safe can be the degree of boat debris in the water. It could be deteriorating or broken <clears throat> boat ramps or infrastructure. It could be boater sobriety. It could be just general rules and regulation enforcement. So <clears throat> we want to know how, how safe do you feel in those spots that you go to most often? <clears throat> Thank you, Patricia. Yep, great point. Thank you for typing that into the chat pod. Okay, we'll go about another five seconds. Four, three, two, one. Thank you. Hey, got a couple people right there right before the end. Thank you. <laughs> Share results. All right. So um, let's see. So they've added those together at 17. So yeah, 45% are somewhat on the unsafe side, a couple neutral. And then uh, so kind of an even split here, honestly, between the somewhat safe and, and above and the somewhat unsafe and below. So perfect. Thank you for going through this uh, with us. So I will stop sharing. And then Jack, uh, back over to you. Okay, thank you, Austin. Um, we're going to move into the workshop portion now where we get to hear your ideas. And But before we do that, we have some quick ground rules that we want to go over with you. Make sure that you are respectful and courteous to each other as we go along. I know there won't be a lot of uh, uh, interaction verbally on this, probably mostly through the Q&A, uh, but, um, but still we want to make sure that we uh, uh, acknowledge that and also we will be spending about 15 minutes on each of the questions we've got basically two questions that are very broad um, that we're going to be asking for your opinions and comments on and then uh, the second one is where we really need your creativity and as a friendly reminder um, we have the chat function uh, this feature will be used to track the input and ideas from the workshop We'd appreciate your ability to provide concise and timely comments on that. Um, we also have the raise your hand feature, which we will, if you want to speak uh, uh, directly on the on a subject rather than using the Q and A box, um, uh, please. Uh, but you know, make sure that you don't tie up too much time. I'll, I'll move that along so that we can get back and forth to our question and answers. Um, and then, uh, of course, we have the question and answer box. Um, and please uh, type those on. That's probably the most important box that we have there because we can record your observations and comments um, uh, in both that and the chat room as well. So with that, first question we're throwing out there to you all, we're going to take about 15 minutes here, is what barriers exist that keep you from enjoying Biscayne Bay and the waterfront? And what solutions might you have to those if they are site specific or in general? What barriers exist? Um, those issues that most concern you, whether they are safety related, whether they are crowding, whether they are simply acting, lacking access points. And Austin and Stephanie, you will that will be facilitating those through the Q and A. Yes, and I'll jump in. We've had a couple of folks um, type in some questions and questions here, and thank you for your patience as waiting for this portion. One of our participants shared that speeding of boats and jet skis in the bay is out of control, and it makes it very dangerous for everyone on the water. We desperately need more enforcement of speed limits on the bay, and we do have a question as part of this. What enforcement is currently in place? But I think also this, this ties into those um, barriers as well. Okay, perfect. And then we do have one uh, participant that's raised their hand, so we'll go ahead. So um, I'll make you allow to talk. All right, so go ahead and unmute yourself, uh, Andres, and then you should be able to uh, chat with us. Hi, Austin. Hi, Stephanie. How are you? My name is Andres Abello, and um, 
I actually just heard about this project a couple of days ago through the article in the Miami Herald. And um, I own a business called Paddle. And what Paddle does, it's a self-serve water sports rental. So very similar to City Bike, we created a station-based platform where our riders can unlock the paddle boards and, and take them out for a spin. So one of the major uh, difficulties that we have really seen is just that there's there aren't too many access points that really cater to the local community, which is what we're primarily looking to, to serve. So just basic infrastructure, um, nothing, nothing really drastic is, is the biggest problem I see. And part of the reason that we started this company in the first place, that we just wanted an easy way to get out on the water. So um, definitely see a lot of synergies um, in what we're doing, but above and beyond really like the ability to to just have uh, a lot of these, uh, the, the end streets that, that are located on canals, seeing that be, be accessible, I see a lot of value in that, really to the residents in the area. Very good, thank you, Andres. So that, that, is, a, uh, that is the ride share of, uh, of paddle boards or kayaks, right? Correct. Perfect, good. Perfect. Right. Thank you, Andres. And we have, uh, as, as you uh, were brave enough to initiate this, we have three more people that have raised their hands now. So uh, Andres, I'm going to lower your hand and uh, turn you off again. So next in line is uh, Patricia. So Patricia, uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and then you're, you're free to chat. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, again, my issue is access points. I've been a kayaker canoeist for my entire life and I've a Miami-Dade native. Uh, the challenge though is being able to access and even the access points we have today, oftentimes they are limited by, for example, you can't go out and watch a sunset because you'll get a parking ticket or it'll get locked in the park. So you can't fully use. I mean, I, I do understand why sometimes that's necessary, but access points, not just access points for daytime, but some of the best times to paddle is after work and to go out and enjoy sunsets. So just access point and the time frames available with access points would be important to me. Perfect, expanding hours of operation as well. Got it, thank you, Patricia. All right, thank you, Patricia. I'm gonna go ahead and lower your hand. Perfect. Next up is Antonio. Antonio, I'm allowing you to talk. Go ahead and unmute yourself and then uh, you should be able to uh, chat. Okay, uh, testing, can you hear me okay? Yep. Unclear. Great, um, so I just wanted to bring up two points. So I live here uh, in Miami Beach on the west side. Um, I don't know if you guys caught what was going on during, um, I guess the height of the pandemic in March, April along the Venetian Causeway. It was really nice to see how people were discovering those patches of grass and that access to water. Um, it's like they had um, discovered and defined a whole new park for themselves. I think that's an opportunity. Um, but the other thing I'd like to bring to your attention is um, there was a lot of paddling that was taking place here at the end of uh, Lincoln Road. They were using that as a launch, which was great. Um, but to your point earlier with regards to safety, it was difficult to get to Monument Island just because of uh, the way the jet skis um, and all the other boats race through there. I think it's important to address that because Mon Monument Island should not be reserved um, for only those who can afford to get there by boat. Um, while it was quiet during uh, March and April, I saw so many kayakers and paddleboarders take advantage of having that open access to, to Monument Island. And I, and I think that should continue. I think um, paddleboarders should be able to enjoy um, that island as well. Very good. So, Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, one more here. So I'm going to lower hand. Oh, we got another one too. So Alfonso, Alfonso, um, go ahead and unmute yourself. And uh, yep, can you hear me? Can yes. you hear me? Yeah, I'm, I've been in touch with Stephanie uh, and I've been uh, providing information by email, uh, primarily as it relates to the South Florida Water Management District water control structures. Uh, I, I think back when I was in middle school and there was a water control structure behind Robert King High Park and then I blinked, went to college and when I came back, there was a new water control structure over by uh, east of the airport, uh, just east of the airport lakes. So again, before I was in college, the airport lakes were tidal, today they are not. 
Uh, and uh, this morning, and again, it, it, with the impetus of the Miami Herald article uh, and the conversations with Stephanie, uh, I called the uh, South Florida Water Management District, and, and there are multiple opportunities to open up the freshwater canals with the implementation of locks, navigable locks that go around the Miami-Dade, I'm sorry, uh, go around the South Florida Water Management District locks. Uh, the, the waterfront that you would open up to get to the Atlantic Ocean and to Biscayne Bay is immense. In, in fact, the, the entire freshwater waterfront probably exceeds the entire waterfront of Miami-Dade County and Biscayne Bay by a large margin. You just got to get from point A to point B. Uh, the, the South Florida Water Management District does not have a fundamental problem with that. And if you look at some of the opportunities and exactly where they are, you will see that there's plenty of room in the existing South Florida Water Management District right away to provide those locks. So if you're talking about a barrier, that that's a literal barrier. It's it's yeah. not it's not a barrier like the, the like the barrier that exists in Homestead Bayfront Park. And I love Homestead Bayfront Park because I can get there on the expressway, never have to fight traffic, never stop at a red light, turn left at the at at the uh, speedway. But then when if it's full, it is a nightmare because the 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 entire road backs up and there's no way to turn around. So that's the, the worst of all worlds, of all worlds. And, and, and that's something that can't be fixed without getting rid of the overcrowding. And the way to get rid of the overcrowding is to take, find another chunk of waterfront like Black Point and build another Black Point. But, but that's, that's so fantastically expensive. And from a, from a permitting standpoint, it, it's a fantasy land. Whereas what I'm proposing, you're opening up more waterfront. There's thousands and thousands of homes that could be set up with ramps and docks. And granted, the, 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 the length of the distance is long, but hey, you know, you, 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 you turn on the, 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 the radio and, and, and do your canal cruising and it's part of your outing. So the, the, the barrier is, is the South Florida Water Management District structures, the solution, put in locks. That, Perfect. Yeah. Alfonso, and keep those pictures coming. I'm glad you're sending them to Stephanie because she forwarded them to me. And if you, as you go through Google Earth, you keep finding more of those, take the screenshots, send them, and we'll get that all mapped in GI. We're, we're, we're going to turn uh, Miami-Dade County in, into Venice if you let us. <laughs> it's got the potential. It sure does. When you think about the lake belt and all the opportunities on the West End. Just throw money at it. Yep. yep. Very good. Thanks, Thank Alfonso. You. Thank you. Right. Do we have any Do you have any Q and A that's on there that people are writing in or? I do, and I'd like to jump in. I know Elvis has his has his hand up, but we'll, we'll jump to the Q and A just for a moment. Uh, there's a, a couple additional uh, barriers. Uh, some folks have have chimed in. There's a little enforcement on the no wake rule, and also it's on speed limits. And that's a real barrier to to feeling comfortable on the water. Perfect. And I'll turn it over to you. I know there's been a wonderful amount of comments in the chat. I know we can't answer them all, but there are a lot of great feedback. And we appreciate everyone's comments. Perfect. So I'll go ahead and, and uh, Elvis, so you're uh, able to talk. Go ahead and just uh, unmute yourself there. And uh, Got it. there you go. Can you hear me? Absolutely. OK, great. First of all, I was very pleased to see the presentation that mentioned needing more access for everyone. And towards that end, I'd like to mention that unfortunately, the current Miami-Dade Parks rules do not allow ultralight seaplanes from utilizing the shorelines of the parks. And these are legal recreational craft. And the solution is very simple. To allow ultralight seaplanes to use park shorelines, such as at Crandon, Black Point, Madison Hammock. Uh, we would set up on land, then taxi away from the shoreline for all takeoffs and landings and taxi back. So there's really not a safety issue. I'm not sure why. I've never been able to get a, a straight answer as to why that rule was enacted way back when. Nobody knows the history on that, but that's worth doing in order to ensure better public access to the waterfront. Very good. Thank, thank you, Elvis. All right. Thank you, Elvis. Thank you. All right, uh, that was the last person that had their hand raised so far. So yes, to the second point, a lot of people in the chat pod. <laughs> Good, well, let, let's jump over to the next question, which is a little bit, it just takes it a little step further. 
Um, and the next step question is what transformational opportunities can you recommend and what would that access look like or that enhancement look like? We've heard uh, already about creating and uh, you know, building another black point. There are opportunities in the Chapman Field area. There are some land that has been identified in, uh, in a couple of different areas that uh, may, be, uh, may be viable. So if you have any other ideas or options, what would that look like? Or enhancements, more artificial reefs, where might those, where might those be? Uh, we've had some good suggestions about shoreline swimming access to artificial reefs, smaller artificial reefs that are accessible for people without boats. So those sorts of creative kinds of things, or any of you land lovers that might be on there, if there's any particular areas where fishing used to be, and I know I grew up in Miami and you know I remember how I fished from bridges all the time. We just don't see that anymore. So, you know, if there are opportunities that are there, um, and likewise for even, you know, entertainment areas and things like that as well. So what transformational opportunities can you recommend and what might they look like? What kind of access or enhancement might that be? And uh, Andres raises his hand again. So um, Andres, uh, you are able to chat. Go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and you're off. Thank you, Austin. So um, like I stated before, and really the, the basis of, of us launching this business paddle that we started, um, we provide the self-serve kiosk that would be a great enhancement at any waterfront location. The, the stations themselves are equipped with their own base, which is uh, sturdy enough to, with, to withstand a tropical storm or a hurricane force wind. Um, the only thing at that point, if that ever comes to need, we take off the equipment and store it. But the stations themselves are solar powered, they're self-sufficient, and really are entirely green. They don't need to be connected to any grid and provide the amenity at no cost. So my company actually covers all of the costs uh, regarding the implementation and operation of the station. And we give back a, a revenue share back to the city. So it's, it's a, a twofold sense where it really provides a benefit for the city, a benefit for anybody who wants access to the water and doesn't want to, doesn't want to purchase their own equipment or doesn't have anywhere to store their own equipment. So you just have the equipment on site ready for use. Good. Okay. Andres, thank you. And, uh, send this, that information to Stephanie and, uh, We'll give you an address, an email address later so that we can uh, explore that further with you. Thank you. Okay. I just wanted to jump in. I saw in the chat from one of our participants that the chat comments again, same consideration as those speaking, and you absolutely are. Uh, they're uh, unfortunately given, given the, the time and also the number of participants and chat comments that we're receiving, there's no way for us to, sit, to you know, share every single comment, but they are all logged. And so we download that information and it's part of our, our records and feedback and consideration as we move forward in, in, in the, our analysis phase. Thank you for that question. Absolutely. And we have another hand raised. So Carlos, uh, you are able to talk now. Go ahead and unmute yourself and then you should be able to chat. Yeah, linking to what Andre was saying about folks that don't have um, storage capacity in their homes and or transportational ability, it will be interesting to develop like a locker system. You know, you were talking about Chapman a little while ago. That's one of my favorite places, but at various places around the county, we could set up very low cost um, um, kayak, canoe, paddle craft um, lockers, could, which could just be, you know, long trenches look, looking like a, a stack of coffins and you just slide your boat in and you can lock it and secure it and leave it close to where you like to play and then you can go by and uh, use it whenever you want. Yeah, kind of like a dinghy rack that you have at a marina when there's moorings out where people can move. So good idea. Very good. Thank you. We've Nobody had else from folks that would like to see zoning changes so that they require, you know, storage facilities in new, newly built condominiums and rental units where people can that are near the water so that those kinds of storage units, similar, similar to that last comment regarding lockers. Sorry, Austin, go ahead. You were going to say something? Oh, sure. Just a couple of things. Uh, yeah, one is um, in the actual chat pod in the two 
uh, function, there is a drop down. You can actually select and go to all panelists and attendees. So just make sure that it is selected that way so everybody can see the, um, the comments. I think it might default to all panelists. So that was a good point. And then uh, Sean has raised his hand. So I'm gonna allow Sean here. So Sean, uh, go ahead and unmute yourself now and then you should be able to uh, chat. Hi, uh, my name is Sean Baytel. I live on the Miami River, uh, 37 year uh, resident of Miami. Um, I sent you an email with some uh, canoe uh, sites, it, you know, historical sites along the Miami River. Uh, and uh, recently a group of paddlers and I traveled the Miami River and we were surprised to find that there are zero access points open right now. We then, uh, we then went up to Fort Lauderdale and paddled down the New River. And one of the things that we could implement very easily here, especially when we've got the permanent sites closed for construction or whatever, uh, let's get some floating docks on the river, like at Lummis Park and whatnot, where people can get in and out of paddle uh, vessels easily. You, there's just no way to get up and down the seawall at low tide from a paddle vessel, especially with the condition that the uh, that the ladders, the, the, you know, the ladders are in. Very good. Thank, thank you, Sean. Sure. Perfect. Thank you, Sean. We have a couple more people that their hands are raised. So let me see here. Alfonso. Um, all right. You go ahead and unmute yourself, Alfonso, and then go ahead and chat. Yeah. Hello again. I, I made a comment earlier about uh, traversing the canals when I was in middle school and one of the guys I did it with just called in. I want to identify him, but he was right there. So it's, it, it, the interest hasn't waned. The, the, uh, the transformational opportunities and the access, I think you at parks already have those opportunities. You, got, you have Bird Drive Park. At Bird Drive Park, you're on, you're on a waterway already. Uh, and all you see when you get back there is riprap. You can turn that riprap into ramps, into anything you want. There's plenty of room to access that canal. And when we, when we get the, uh, the locks built, we'll be able to go from Bird Drive Park to the bay. Another opportunity is a park that's uh, just west of 127th Avenue on the Tamiami Canal. And, uh, and, and that, that is right there by the, uh, by, by the Tamiami Canal. That could, that could be used for access also. And those are just, just two that, that, that I know of, that I reacted to, and that I communicated with Stephanie about, uh, about their existence. There's probably a whole, a whole lot more, and I'll keep looking, and I'll, I'll keep you advised by email, and I'll keep the graphics coming. Thank you. Thanks, Alfonso. And you brought up a good point because there are there is a good connection between um, the Ludlam Trail, the future building of the Ludlam Trail, which intersects there at Bird Drive or A.D. Barnes Park, um, and you know Snapper Creek, um, and some of the the you know opportunities that exist there behind Dadeland Mall, where the Underline and the Ludlam Trail intersect with water. Huge opportunities. And we have two people in the queue. So uh, Eric, uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and then go ahead. Hey, uh, yeah, I just wanted to second that comment. I think we have a lot of similar areas like the underline is doing underneath the bridge areas. I was at American Social the other day. Um, and I think if we utilize those underneath spaces for the bridges uh, for some of these, for the locker stuff, for some storage areas, um, that may be a good way to clean this up and have some additional areas. And a lot of those seem to be next to some parks, but they don't necessarily have the access down into to the water. So I think this is great. Thanks for putting it on this. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Eric. All right. And then Carlos, uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on some of the stuff that's, that we were discussing. Um, keep it simple. You know, you don't need to have a massive structure. You don't need to have something artistic and beautiful. Just a nice place where you can launch, get your boat in and out of the water. Um, you know, I compare the, the Deering um, Estate launch to the launch at, um, at um, uh, Convoy Point at Biscayne National Park. The one at, um, the one at Deering Estate has to have cost millions of dollars. The one at Everglades, I mean at Biscayne is 
basically a string of PVC pipes going down the beach. That's all you need, you know, or like, like Al was saying, a, a, a float so that people can launch. It's all you need. You don't need a major construction project. You don't need to spend all that much money. We'd rather have more places at a lower cost and simpler design than mega structures. Okay, thank you, Carlos. And I, I'm gonna be timekeeper for a second. It is 6.52. We promise everyone we're done by, by seven. However, for those who might've arrived a bit later, um, Jack had shared that we are going, that uh, Jack, Austin and I are going to be um, go, moving forward with our presentation, but we'll be hanging back for anyone who'd like to speak with us further on, on questions. And, and just to highlight again, if you know, we are able to, to capture everything you're writing in the Q&A and, and in the chat. So please don't feel like, um, as though you know, we can't answer all your questions, but please don't feel that we're not able to, but we will be following up. So thank you for your feedback. Perfect. And then we do have another person that raised their hand, uh, and Sean. Then think, and then I think we're gonna, we're, we're gonna wrap it after that, Austin, so we can keep going. And those, those who wanna stay with, can stay with us. So uh, go ahead, Sean. Perfect. Okay, I, I already introduced myself the second comment. Law enforcement, we gotta get law enforcement on the water, uh, fish and wildlife, uh, uh, city of Miami Marine Patrol, and we got to get them to actually write tickets. Uh, we're seeing more of them since the coronavirus. Uh, maybe there's more funding or something, but uh, noise, noise pollution, weight, uh, damage. I have a sailboat on the river, damaged regularly up against the pilings by uh, fast moving boats. There's also a a piece of land at 27th Avenue owned by, I think it's uh, South Florida Water Management District. And there's, uh, it's gated off to the public, but there's a guy that's got, uh, uh, he built a dock on it and he's got a gate in, in their fence, uh, stuff like that. You know, we need to have, we need to, we need to keep our eyes out for abuses and, uh, and uh, enforce the law. That's public land. It should be open to all, not just one person. Very good. Thank you, Sean. Okay, folks, we're gonna we're gonna wrap this section here, and I know we've gone through uh, our Q and A section there as well. So, like Stephanie said, we'll stick around for a little while after for those of you who still want to stay with us. Um, so, the, our next steps: um, we're going. We we need you all when you leave here because you participated tonight. Um, does not relieve you of the obligation that we want to put on you to go to the website and to take the survey for the Waterfront Recreation Access Plan. This will take you about 15 to 20 minutes um, to do. Um, it is very important because it's, a, it's, a, it's significantly more depth to the questions that Austin asked you earlier. And it really will help us to find and identify the sectors geographically where we need to concentrate, get your ideas and your needs and really give us the data that we need to do it. So that will stay open until about September 20th. Um, so um, we're, we're right now, I think we've had about 500 or so folks that have taken the survey. Um, we need to get, and, and you know, we, we will be happy if we get around 2000 surveys done. So please, if you can take it, tell your friends, your family, anybody that you have, anybody in your network that can take the survey, um, it will only provide more access in the future. So now um, your input is gonna be important on this next little survey piece that we're gonna do. Um, and we just need to know how we can improve these, how we did, um, and so I'm gonna turn it back over to Austin. Thanks, Jack. And then um, actually just as of today, we're now over 1100 for the survey completions. Oh, wow. All right. So we're getting close to that 2000 mark we want. That's beautiful. Absolutely. So we can't stop now, though. So keep the keep the pedal. Absolutely. Down. All right. Good. All right. So now that you're familiar with the uh, good old polling uh, function, this one's a little bit different because it's a meeting evaluation. And there's four questions. So you have to scroll, I believe, on your screen to answer them. And I'm not going to broadcast the results because we're, we take all this and we document it. Uh, for our meeting facilitation, but it's four questions. Uh, the first one is overall, you're satisfied with the way the meeting was conducted. 
it's on a scale of strongly disagree up to uh, strongly agree. Uh, again, one answer choice there. And uh, the second question is overall, you found the meeting engaging. Same scale, strongly disagree up to uh, strongly agree. Uh, third question in, in the queue there is uh, more than multiple choice. So it's, uh, you can select all that apply here. So like to see time for discussion, um, the information maybe was too technical, uh, the audio visual uh, connection should be improved. Um, other, you know, if you have some other um, idea for that. And what I'm gonna do is type into the chat pod evaluation poll other. <laughs> if you'd like to tell us what that other is, please go ahead and type that in there so we can document that. Uh, or if you don't have any feedback to improve the meeting, that's fine. And then the uh, fourth question down there is a uh, select all that apply, multiple choice. It's just how do you learn about this workshop? So is it via Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, newspaper advertisement? Uh, there's Miami Dade County Park Life e newsletter. There's Miami Dade County Park staff, maybe interaction. Maybe the Miami Dade County website, the next door, either application on your phone or the website, uh, Twitter, word of mouth, or again, um, was it was it other? So it's down there again. So again, if uh, yeah, perfect. So thank you. You're already typing that in. So found out via an email received. Absolutely. Um, so this is very helpful. So again, we'd like any and all feedback there. So I'm going to leave this open for a little bit because again, I know how many people were um, participating. <laughs> Uh, in the polling earlier. So we're about 10 people away from that number right now. I can see that. So uh, please fill out the survey if you can, and then we'll resume uh, as Jack and Stephanie mentioned with a little bit more of a overtime, uh, if, you, if you will. So we'll go just a little bit longer here. So let's do 10 seconds. Let's do uh, 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, Three, two, one. Thank you very much. So I'm gonna end the polling there. And then um, just before I turn it back over, there is a question I see in the chat pod. Uh, what's the next step in RAP development? So just wanted to make sure before, uh, if Jay signs off, uh, just for the benefit of the group, that maybe we wanna address that one. Sure. The next step as we go through, when we close the survey out, we will analyze all of the data that's there um, and all of the data that we've received from all of our stakeholder focus groups that, that have occurred. Um, we will be putting those together and meeting with the Park and Recreation Department to develop a, the format of the plan. And the way Stephanie and I have looked at it now with the scheduling, it is more than likely that the plan will be developed and released to the public by the first of the year, sometime in January of 2021. Um, so we're gonna, we've got quite a few more steps to go through and a lot of writing to do because this is going to be several hundred pages uh, when, by the time we get done, especially with this kind of input. So, um, okay, so I guess our next, uh, let's see if we can, oh, there we go. So our final piece here is that if you have any questions or feedback and we're right on time here, um, we please send it to Stephanie Cornejo, Park Planner 3, her email, you can see it on the screen there, um, or you have a telephone number at 305-755-7957. Uh, make sure that information gets to her by September 20th because that's when we are closing down things and all of that goes into the hopper and we start making decisions and getting this into an organized fashion for the complete wrap plan. You can always stay connected to us on Facebook and on Twitter. Uh, please always look us up at the Miami-Dade Parks uh, website and um, we're available uh, anytime. So with that, I wanna thank Austin and Stephanie and thank all of you who participated tonight. Um, great job, we got some great stuff and we're gonna stick around here. So those of you who choose to sign off now can do so. And those of you who'd like to chat a little more um, or have other ideas that you didn't, uh, you feel a little bashful and you feel feel better when we kind of go offline into overtime, then uh, we'll be here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much for joining.